Get started. Um, so uh, two quick things about project number one. As a reminder, it's due a week from now. And so Auto Lab should be working, so you should be able to submit it and get back a grade and a uh, log file to say what happened to your submission. Um, some of you have already submitted it and gotten perfect score, so that's good. Uh, the other thing to announce is that on Thursday last week, I sent out a notice on Piazza that everyone that's in the course uh, needs to sign up for a project group for project number two, which comes out a week from today. Uh, some of you have listed yourself in a group, some of you have listed yourself as free agents, and some of you have not put your name at all. So I'll give you a few more days. Uh, if you're not in a group, then I will just randomly assign you to a group, and it's up to you to figure out how to make that work. Uh, that means like if the person that you're working with has body odor issues or other problems, you're stuck with them for the, for the entire project too. So it's up to you now to be able to figure out what group you want to be in so you don't have this problem later on. Uh, so any questions about project one? Any questions about signing up to be in a group for project two? And probably what will happen is whatever group you're in for project two will just be, you roll over into project three and that'll be your, the group you're in for the final project. So choose your partners wisely. Okay? All right. So, um, for today's class, we're going to now start talking about indexes. So we're now going to start to understand like, the next component we need in our database system is to be able, be able to access data very quickly in order to, to execute queries and do other operations we want to do. So for today's assigned reading was really about a survey of all the sort of index locking and latching techniques that can occur inside of a database system. But then going forward on Wednesday and Monday next week, we'll look at specialized indexes for you know, the two different types of workloads we could have, OLAP and OLTP. So for today's class, we're going to start off talking about order-preserving indexes. Uh, and I'll discuss at a high level some of the major ones that, that are out there. And then we'll go into details about locking and latching in, inside of an index. And for that part, we'll just assume that we're going to deal with B plus tree indexes because they're the most common type of index you can have in a database system. And then we'll finish off with a discussion and overview of different prison gang tattoos that you're going to need to be aware of in case you end up in prison and need to be able to navigate those waters. Because a lot of people that get involved in databases uh, get, end up in prison, so you need to know how to be able to handle yourself. Okay? So uh, I, don't, I don't think we really need to be able to define an index, right? Everyone should pretty much know. But the basic idea of an index is that we're going to trade off having to pay additional writing overhead and storage overhead in this index in order to make retrieval of particular data items that we need during our runtime as we execute queries much faster. Right? We could just do a sequential scan across the entire database and look for everything every single time. But if we need one particular item or a range of items, an index is going to allow us to be able to do that uh, very efficiently. And it's, in general, it's worth the overhead of having to maintain the index in order to get those fa faster queries. Now, there are some systems that we're not really going to talk about that essentially do continuous uh, full table scans all the time. So they just sort of have one cursor that's scanning through the entire, entire table all, over and over again. And then if you're a thread that wants to access the table, you sort of jump on the train as it goes around, and you scan for whatever amount of data you need, and then you jump off when you're done. Nobody really does that in practice. Everyone pretty much uses indexes to be able to find things very quickly. So the most common index we have in database systems today is the venerable B plus tree. So before we go into the detail of the B plus tree, I want to spend some time to differentiate between the B tree and the B plus tree, because sometimes these, these terms are used interchangeably, but nobody in practice actually implements a B tree. Everyone implements the B plus tree. So it's good to know what the difference is. And again, in a lot of the literature from the 1970s, early 1980s, there was B star trees, B link trees, B trees. There was all these different types of trees. But in the end, it's the B plus tree that everyone uses. So, the two major classes of indexes that we can have for data structures are the order-preserving indexes, and this is where the B tree falls in, uh, and then the hashing indexes. So the order-preserving indexes are essentially always going to be some kind of tree structure where you're going to maintain the keys of the index or the attributes that you're indexing on in some sorted order. Right? And then this is going to allow us to be able to do all the you know, point queries, range scans, uh, in reverse and forwards order. Uh, every, within the single index. And it's going to allow us to do all these searches in O log n. An alternative is to do what's called a hashing index. And this is essentially building a hash table or an associative array that's going to map single keys uh, to individual elements. 
right? So you basically take your value, you're trying to look up, you hash it, look in the hash table, and that tells you what that, what, where that element is. Um, these are not that used that often in sort of user exposed indexes. And what I mean by that is if you call create index, you're most likely going to get an order preserving index. You're not going to get a hash index. Can anybody take a guess why? Let's say I buy a new database system, I paid a lot of money, I call create index, and it, underneath the covers, unbeknownst to me, it calls hash index. And the first thing I do is, you know, select count star between some range, right? Can that use the hash index? No, right, because you can't do range scans on hash index. So by default, most indexes, most database systems are going to give you this. It's only if you ask it for a hash index will you get something like this. Now, internally, as you saw this in, in the, the hash join project, internally the database systems can be using hash, hash tables all the time. So it's definitely uh, good to have a good hash table implementation. And we'll discuss next week some of the different, more modern variants of it. Um, but in practice, unless you really ask for it, you don't really get a hash index. And some database systems actually don't even offer support for it um, for that very reason, because they don't want people to sort of trip up on themselves. The nice thing about the hash index is that although you can only do equality predicates, uh, you can do searches in, I guess that should be ON, it should be O1, right? Because you can just immediately go get the one thing that you need um, without having to traverse anything else. So for this class, we're mostly going to focus on the order preserving indexes. For Wednesday's class, that'll be also order preserving indexes. And then for Monday next week, we'll spend some time talking about hash indexes because this is what you would want to use uh, in OLAP queries when you want to do hash joins and other things. Right? You can build temporary hash tables or hash indexes on the fly to make your join go faster. And that's essentially what you're doing in the hash join operator. Okay, so the original B tree was developed in 1972 by, I think, a bunch of Germans. Um, and the basic idea of a B tree is that it's a, it's a, it's a balancing tree where we're going to store the keys and values all throughout the nodes of the tree. Remember, in our case, because we're dealing with in-memory databases, the values are always going to be 64-bit pointers to the actual tuple in memory. In our case, they're, they're you know, 48-bit pointers, but you still have to represent that as a 64-bit integer. The difference between a B tree and a B plus tree is that the B plus tree is only going to store the values, again, the memory pointers to the tuples, in the leaf nodes. There's not going to be any uh, you know, pointers to tuples in the inner parts. And so what this allows us to do, essentially, the inner nodes end up being like guideposts as we traverse the index to find the data that we want in the leaf nodes, right? Where in the B plus tree, we could find things anywhere in any node. Um, and so the, sort of one of the advantages of the B plus tree over the B tree is that it's going to be a lot easier for us to do, allow for concurrent access because we only have to worry about locking at the leaves of the trees. We don't have to worry about locking up the upper parts. We still have to take latches on it as we go down so that nobody modifies the data structure as we're moving. But all the logical locks that we'll talk about and you read in the survey paper, all that only needs to be done in the leaf nodes, right? So this, again, this is the key difference you need to understand. So in a B tree, the memory pointers are everywhere. In the B plus tree, they're only in the leaves. So typically, when you take an introduction database course, we always draw sort of some sample B plus tree that looks like this. Uh, and then we always sort of draw the contents of the leaf node sort of as, as an example like this. So you have at the one end of the array and the other end, you have pointers to the, lex, the next node in the, in, in, along the leaves. And then this inner part here, you have uh, every, other, every other pair is a key value pair of the, the element we're indexing. So the first element would be the key, and the second element would be the value, and then so on going forward like that. In practice, this is not actually how you know, indexes are actually implemented. Can anybody take a guess why? Yes. That's going to be a big part of it. Yes, variable length keys. So in our case, the value is always going to be 64 bits, but the keys can be arbitrary length. So, so creating an array like this is difficult to do because now you're going to have to store what the size of the offset is for, for every single element. So in practice, and the, again, the values are just pointers. In practice, they, they usually look something like this. There's a bunch of metadata we're going to maintain at the top. So like what level is the leaf node in or what level is the node in? In this case here, it's always at the bottom. We'll keep track of the number of free slots that we have. And that way, we need to make a decision whether we need to split or merge the node based on the on insert or delete. And then we still have our pointers to the previous and next. But now we're going to have two separate arrays, uh, one for the sorted keys and one for the values. So essentially, these, if for each offset in this array corresponds to an offset in the 
in the value array. So now it's really easy to say, all right, I'm at offset three for this key, and I know how to find the pointer I want for the tuple that I'm looking for. So in practice, this is usually how people implement it. Again, but now we're, again, we're still assuming that the keys are fixed length. We'll deal with the variable length keys in a second. But this implementation is, is much more efficient and much better because everything will be word aligned. So it's easier to run instructions in the processor to traverse these things and modify them without worrying about spreading over from, you know, you know having misaligned uh, byte streams. So the two design choices we have to deal with in our B plus tree is the first we need to deal with non-unique values. So not every index is going to be a primary key index, and not every index is going to be a unique index. So it's possible that we could have duplicate keys uh, where the same key maps to multiple values. So we need to be able to handle that. And then the example that Matt brought up is you need to be able to handle variable length keys. Right? And again, in an introdu introduction database class, we always talk about keys being on integers and things like that. So those are always going to be 32 bits or 64 bits. But certainly if you do an index on a string, like someone's last name, then that can be variable length. And so now our fixed length array may not always work. We're not going to talk about inverted indexes or how you do sort of more complicated full text searches. Maybe that's something we'll discuss later in the class. But that's sort of outside the scope of what we're dealing with here. For assume for variable length keys, it's like you know, some varchar, a small varchar field. So let's go through each of these and what we have to do, discuss what we have to do. So for, for non-unique indexes, there are two approaches to dealing with this. The first is that you essentially just duplicate every key in your sort of key array. And uh, you store it multiple times, and they each have their own offset. And the second approach is you have a secondary value list uh, that you're going to maintain separately for each key inside of the, the, the B, B plus tree node. So in the duplicate key case, it's pretty straightforward. Again, this key one is duplicated three times. So we'll have three uh, occurrences of it in our sorted array, and they'll each point to their own offset here. So this is nice because this allows us to still do the binary search within the B plus tree node when we need to find the, the element that we're looking for. With the value list, it's basically we have a separate array for every single key. And somehow we're maintaining an offset from this key to the start of this array. So now the advantage is this key is only, shown, is only stored once. Uh, and then we have to have the, you know, the separate array for, the, for all the, the values of it. So in general, as many things in databases, there's no one better way to do this, whether you use the duplicate keys or the value list. The duplicate key way is nice because it's really easy to find the thing you're looking for. But then the downside is you're essentially wasting space because you're storing the key multiple times. In the case of the value list, it's nice because you only store the key once. But now you need to maintain these linked lists or these, these separate arrays and know how to link them you know, at this offset is for this key goes to this value list. Right? And these value lists can obviously be a variable length. So you have to deal with you know, memory management within the B plus tree node. And the various database systems all do different things. So now we've got to deal with variable length keys. And there's essentially three, three approaches to doing this. The first is like the easiest thing to do. And that's where instead of storing the actual key inside the node in that sorted array, we'll just store a pointer to the actual tuple. And then if we want to know its value, we have to follow the tuple and look, look at the value. Right? You could store the link to be directly to the actual varchar field, or the varchar attribute in the tuple. Right? But in, in, pra in practice, that's usually a bad idea because you, sort of the indirection of having those variable length pools makes it easier to move things around uh, in your memory allocator. Whereas if you point directly to it, then you need to make sure that no index, that, you know, no index is pointing to your attribute when you, when you shuffle things. So we'll see in a second how you do this in actually in another index. But in practice, nobody does this first one. The second two approaches are more common. Uh, the first is to use variable length nodes. So instead of allocating every node to be a fixed size and filling it up with, with attributes as you go along, you can allow the size of every B plus tree node to be whatever length it needs to be. Um, this makes it a bit more tricky to do memory management because now if you sort of, if you have to delete a node, uh, you may not be able to you know, put it back into a general pool and reuse the memory. You may have to free it and malloc it again because it may not be the correct size that you need. And you may have to grow the node as well. And that gets expensive if you have to update pointers. The, second, or the third approach is to use called a key map. And essentially, we're going to embed an array of pointers inside of our B plus tree node that will then point to separate key value lists. So it's sort of like the same thing as a value list. But now we sort of have a, another level of indirection. So this looks like this. So now in our key map, instead of having uh, the actual keys here, these are pointers to these lists where the first element will always be a key that we want. and then followed by the list of values. Um, this is actually what's used in, in a lot of database, database systems. This is what DB2 does. 
uh, this is what I think MySQL does as well. And when you kind of squint at this, this key value map, what does this look like? What, what's another you know, data organization scheme we talked about earlier that, that looks something like this? Where you have these sort of slots and you're, and you're pointing to something. I just gave it away. What's that? It's a lot of pages, right? Right, because we have, we have our pointer is pointing to some location in the node, the memory, the byte stream for the node that says corresponds to here, here's where this, this element is. Right, so again, in practice, this is what usually everybody does. Okay? So, uh, as I said, the, the B plus tree is probably the most common data structure that you use in databases. Pretty much every single database system that's out there uh, that supports relations will, will provide you with a B plus tree. Um, but it's not the only order preserving data structure that's out there. There's a lot of different alternatives, um, and, but there, no, one is, no other one is, is used as, as often as the B plus tree. So for this, I'm listing here uh, some alternatives to B plus tree that, actually, that are used in some systems. T trees, skip lists, radic trees, or sometimes it's called Patricia trees. Um, I actually looked, looked this up. It's actually named, there's, there's nobody named Patricia. It's actually an acronym that stands for something, um, but, I, but I forget what. Uh, mass tree, which is in silo, and fractal trees, which is sort of a, it's also known as a streaming B plus tree that's used in uh, the Tokutech uh, database system. So for this class, I'm only going to discuss T trees and skip lists. Uh, we'll discuss radix trees and possibly mass trees uh, next class. Again, fractal trees are um, they're, they're primarily used in disk-based systems, so we're not really, we're not really going to cover that. So th we're going to focus on these two today. So T trees uh, came out of the 1980s by some pioneering work that was done at the University of Wisconsin. So the University of Wisconsin people were doing some awesome stuff in the early in-memory database systems. So they had a little prototype, and they explored a lot of different things like query processing, indexing, join algorithms, and, 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 and things of that nature in the system. But it was never really like, you know, commercialized, but actually made into a real system that other people could use. Because um, certainly in the 1980s, it's, we still weren't quite ready yet for a, you know, having a database fit entirely inside of DRAM. So later on in the 1990s, when the first sort of, what I'll say, full-featured in-memory database systems came out, Times 10 was the first one. Uh, at ts Data Blitz or Dolly was, an, was the other one. They all ended up using T trees because T trees were designed specifically for main memory databases. They were designed to reduce the amount of storage overhead you needed to maintain maintain, maintain the index. Um, so they're based on AVL trees, which is sort of a, a variant of a, you know another variant of a structured order preserving tree database index. Um, and we'll go through what it looks like in a second. But again, the main thing that, that the main idea of what a T tree is going to do over a B plus tree is that it's going to have less storage overhead because it's not going to store the keys in the actual nodes themselves. It's going to store pointers back to the, the original tuples in the table heap. Remember, we talked about that for the variable length keys. Instead of storing the keys, you store a pointer to the keys. T trees essentially does that. So let's look, look what it looks like. So this is a sort of high level diagram of what the T tree uh, looks like. Um, and we'll focus in on what these nodes look like. So the first is obviously that you see that it gets the name T tree, you know, based on that the, the, the data structure looks somewhat like a, like a tree. And so inside of a T tree node, it's going to have a bunch of pointers. So the top, we're going to have a pointer to the parent node in our tree. And obviously, if we're the root, we can be null. And then at the bottom, we're going to have pointers to the left child in our tree and the right child in the tree. So in this case here, it would point down to these guys. And if you're, at the, if you're at a leaf node, then it's obviously null. But now this middle part here is going to have pointers to the actual tuples themselves. So this is going to be an array of pointers that are going to be sorted based on the value of the key that corresponds to the tuple that this thing points to uh, in that sorted order for that attribute. So you'll say, I'm, I'm, this T tree is for index, I, index ID, or index on an attribute ID. And all these pointers will be sorted on their values of ID. So when you built it, you have to follow the pointer, figure out what the value is, and figure out what order it should be in. The other thing we have on the, on the, on the beginning and the end of this array are called the node boundaries. So these are actual key values, not the pointers to the tuples, but actual values that correspond to the range that bounds the tuples that are within this, this, this node. So the min would say this is the value that's less than uh, any node that appears in this, in the, or any tuple that appears in my array, and this one is the max, something greater than any value that appears here. And these are sort of guideposts that tell you 
whether you need to look down the left or right child when you're traversing the tree to find something. Okay? So if we say, we take our key space, right? So we say, here's all the possible keys we can have. We'll, we'll order them from one to seven. And we want to say, now when we apply this to the, to the tea tree, we see our ordering looks like this. Right? So, so no longer, it's, like, it's not like the B plus tree anymore. We're going to have along the leaf nodes all our keys. All our keys are going to be embedded throughout, throughout the, the entire index. Right? So now, say I want to do a scan from 2 to 5. Is that going to be good or bad in, in a tea tree? Compared to the B plus tree, is, is this, is this tea tree going to be able to execute the scan more quickly? Shaking head no. Why? Why? Why, why no? Absolutely. So, so basically what's going to happen is I start off the root and say I, I, I need to find two. Well, I start here and I would look at the min and the max. I would see the min value for this is anything less than four. I'm looking for two, so therefore I'm less than four. So I would go down here. And now I find my two. I access this guy. Now I, I can scan all, all of the, the values. But it's even, it's, it's, it gets even worse because now I've got to follow these pointers to actually get to, to the actual tuples themselves. And then I go down here to three. I do the same thing. But I traverse back up to two to get back to four. So you're chasing pointers all up around this tree right? just to do these, these scan operations. Whereas in the B plus tree, you could just go along the leaf nodes and get one after another after another. Right? So this sucks for cache locality because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm recursively going up and down this tree, and I'm basically throwing away all the pages that I may have in my lower CPU caches. It also makes it really difficult to do uh, concurrency control because remember we said in the B tree it's hard because the data items could actually be in the inner nodes themselves, right? Whereas in the B plus tree everything's in the leaf nodes, so that's the only stuff we need to lock. Whereas in this case, in the T tree, all the data items, again, could be in the inner nodes. So again, that makes it harder to do, have concurrent access without you know, violating serializable guarantees. So the main advantage of the T tree is that it's going to use less memory because you don't have to store the keys in the nodes. Again, think about back in 1986, memory was still very limited. So you're, you, the amount of, you know, if you can squeeze some extra memory by reducing the size of your index, that made a big difference. You also have to recognize back in the 1980s and 1990s, the speed difference between CPU level caches and main memory were not as, as, as quite pronounced as they are now. Right? So accessing stuff in like L1, L2, L3 probably didn't exist then, was basically the same as going reading something in DRAM. But now in our modern chips, L1, L2 are orders of magnitude faster than going to the memory controller, going to DRAM. So in, in before, when we were chasing pointers, it didn't really matter that, yeah, you know, yeah we're blowing away our L1 cache. But we're going to DRAM anyway, and it basically costs the same. Where now is that we can maximize the, the amount of data we can reuse in our low-level caches, we're going to get much better performance. And B trees essentially pro sort of provide this to us for free, because if we're doing scans, we're going in order, and we're looking at every single item in the page one by one before we go to the next one. So again, the disadvantage is that we're going to have to chase pointers, and that, that hurts our cache performance. It's difficult also to rebalance, which I'm not really going to talk about. But like, if you have to split and merge nodes, you have to rotate things. And this is a byproduct of being from an AVL tree. And then that's hard to do when you have concurrent access. Um, and then in general, also, too, again, because you have to lock the inner nodes of the B tree, or the, sorry, of the T tree, that makes it hard to do uh, transactions in this thing. So again, the early main memory databases systems in the 1990s all used T trees. Nobody basically uses them today that I know of. The only few that I know are Extreme DB, but that I think they are trying to run on, um, or on like you know really memory constrained devices, uh, but like you know times ten is probably the most famous in memory database. They use T trees in the '90s. They threw it away, and now they're using B plus trees. Everyone pretty much uses B plus trees. Nobody still uses T trees because again, it's, it's the pointer chasing is what's, what's going to kill you. Okay, so another index that has actually been becoming quite popular as an alternative to the B plus tree is the skip list. So most famously, this is the index. This is the index data structure that's used in MemSQL. When MemSQL came out, they announced that they're not going to use B plus trees. They're going to use entirely skip lists. So the way to think of a skip list is that it's a probabilistic data structure where the organization of the index is going to be based on some random coin toss. Uh, so you're, you're going to essentially build these layers of linked lists. 
and the number of elements or which elements you have in the upper levels of the, of, 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 of the, of the index will be determined based on a, on a random number generator. And so it's sort of at a high level, it's going to end up looking like a B plus tree, but instead of having, um, uh, instead of having, you know, these different pointers all the way down, you're only picking some of the keys that you want to index at the top parts. And I'll show what it looks like in a second. So at the lower level of the skip list, you're going to have every key in your key space, and they'll be organized as a singly, uh, a sorted single linked list. And then above that, the next level, you're going to have another linked list, but it's going to have half the keys of the keys that are in the level below it. And then likewise, when you get to the third, it's going to have the half the keys from the one below it. So it's sort of, you see, you're, you're decreasing the amount of data you're storing as you go up, go up in, the, uh, in the index. So the way you're going to determine what, what key, when you start a new key, how many levels to add it to is basically you flip a coin and you keep going until you reach tails. And the number of times you get heads before you hit tails determines how high in the index you'll go. So you see why it's a probabilistic structure, because again, every time you load it, it could be different. Uh, the structure of the index could be different. So it, it, it provides approximate log n search times, which is equivalent to a B plus tree. But in practice, you can get, you can use less memory than a B plus tree. So let's look at an example. So this is what a skip list looks like. So at the bottom, you'll see this is the first level. And we're going to have a, um, we're going to have a linked list that corresponds to, that has every single key in, in our key space. So you have key one, two, three, four, and six. Um, and for each key, they'll have a pointer to the next guy, and then they'll also have the value here, which is, for our case, again, it's just a pointer to the address of the tuple in memory. Now, in the next layer, we're going to have half the keys that are in, in this first one, um, and they'll have, again, the same uh, linked list going from, from, from one element to the next, but then they'll have a pointer to the same key directly below it in, in, in the lower level. So you can sort of think of these as like towers, where for a key two, no matter times, every single time I have it in a different level, it'll always point to the same key two value, so the same key two instance in the, in the level below it. And at the end, you also see here, we have sort of markers that correspond to uh, infinity. This is sort of a, a, a way to signal, signal to the database system as it's traversing the skip list that this is the end of, of the linked list. And the same thing at the top, we can actually have a, uh, a linked list that basically goes from the beginning to end without any elements in it. So let's look at an example and see how we actually insert things and how we actually search in, search in a skip list. So say we want to insert key five. And key five is going to end up here. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go create the elements of, uh, of key five in all three layers. So say we, we flip the coin and we got, we got heads three times, so we're going to put it in level, level three, two, and one. And there's going to link down from each other. And then, before, and then once that's in place, then we can do an atomic swap and change the pointers from the guys below in front of us and the guys behind us to now integrate this, this new key into the linked list. So you can do this actually without locking. You can actually do compare and swap operations and have these changes be applied atomically and not affect the, uh, the correctness of the index at a logical level. So for example, you could install this key for key five, install it on the first level, update these pointers, and you don't necessarily have to update the pointers for these upper levels yet. The key is still be in there, so if anybody does a range scan across the bottom, they'll find our key, but they, we just haven't added this sort of upper level guidepost markers to help you find it faster. Because then we can do the same compare and swap as we go up and add, and add these one by one. So that's that sort of clear what's going on. Now let's talk about how you actually search an, uh, a skip list. So let's say that we want to find K3. We want to find the key 3 So we're going to start off at the first level here. Uh, and at, we always start at the top level. And we're going to look to see what element does this level marker point to. And we want to check to see whether the, the key value is less than the key that we're looking for. So in this case here, this guy points to key 5. And we'll see that key 3 is less than the key 5. So we know we don't want to follow along this path and traverse the index going here. We want to go down actually to the, le the next level. So same thing. Now we check here and see, is our key greater than key 2? In this case, it is yes. So we know that key 3 is going to have to appear somewhere to, to, the, to the right of this, this element here. Do the next check. Is our key 3 less than key 4? It's, it is. So we know, we know we can't go that way. So we go down here, and now we're at key 2. And then we just keep following until we now at the lowest level until we find our key 3. So again, this looks like traversing a B plus tree, 
except now instead of having a rigid, uh, a rigid hierarchy or a rigid protocol for how we create the upper levels of the P plus tree, we have this sort of probabilistic data structure where we can again flip a coin and it'll randomly decide which of these elements are going to be up here. But in practice, when we search them, it ends up being roughly the same speed as a B plus tree. But it makes it much easier now to do, uh, do, do a bunch of operations to insert and delete because we don't have to worry about merging or splitting like we have to do in a B plus tree node, a B plus tree index. So in practice, the skip list is going to use less memory than a, than, than a regular B plus tree only if you don't store the reverse pointers. So this will be important in the next slide. So in my example that I showed you here, we were always going from beginning of the index and traversing in that direction towards the end. If you, have to, if you have to go in the other direction, you have to do something else. You have to do something extra. Or you have to store the pointers to go in the reverse direction. But if you now have you store pointers in the reverse direction, that's extra memory, that's wasted space, and now your skip list is going to be larger than your typical B plus tree. So you lose all the advantages of it. The insertions and deletions are really easy, as I showed. You can do compare and swap operations and add these things atomically, and you don't have to do any rebalancing of the tree. Um, and again, using compare and swap is much faster because you don't have to maintain locks uh, as you do these things. You can do one quick instruction to add, add in, the, add in the, the keys that you want. The downside of the skip list is that it's not as cache friendly as the B plus tree. Remember, on the B plus tree, we can scan across, across the leaf nodes. And we can look at all the elements we, or the keys we need within a single node before we move on to the next one. In the skip list, there's no guarantee that uh, you know, con consecutive elements or consecutive keys are going to be located in the same page or even the same location. So you may end up doing a fetch for one cache line to get one element. And then you have to follow the pointer to the next guy. And it's a whole other cache line you have to bring in. Right? So in practice, you don't get the same cache, uh, cache coherence you get in a B plus tree as you do in a skip list. And again, as I said, doing a reverse search is non-trivial unless you store the reverse pointers. So one of the ways to do reverse, a reverse search is actually something the MemSQL guys came up with, which I think is pretty clever. So again, we don't want to store pointers uh, for every single key in, in our skip list. But instead, we'll store markers uh, in, the end, uh, in this end array here that corresponds to the last element that we looked at when we scanned forward uh, in a previous query in, in, in our key space here. So at this point here, someone reached the end marker here, and the last element it looked at was, was, was key 5. This guy, the last element it looked at was key 4, and this guy, the last element it looked at key 2. So now, we, if we want to do a scan in reverse order, we would start off here and look, to, look at this, uh, this last entry and see whether it's less than, uh, greater than our value, if it's not, then, then we, we can jump to it. And then now we know that the value we're looking for will be in front of it. But in this case, it's not. So we have to go to the next one. Same thing. The value is not in front of the one we're looking for. So we have to go to the next one. And here now we see k2 is in front of uh, k3. So we would jump to this location. And then now we can scan forward and then do know what elements we looked at. And then that's our reverse direction. So I'm showing you an example that is kind of you know, doesn't make any sense to do this reverse search because I just showed you how to do a forward scan to find K3. But in some queries, you may want to do a order by that's in the opposite order of what the, the index is sorted on so that you can find all the elements in, in, in the sort order you want and not have to do an additional sort. So that's one of the advantages you get in the P plus tree. If you have, say, an order by descending, but your index is sorted in ascending order, you can do a descending order scan, and now you don't have to do an additional quick sort to put it in the correct order. So this is sort of allows you to do sort of the same thing, approximate the same thing in a skip list. You pay some extra overhead of having to jump around to find the thing you want and then scan backwards to get it. Uh, but it's going to be the cost of doing this is going to be less than having to do a quick sort, especially if you have a large intermediate data set. So the interesting thing about skip list is that, again, mem when, when MemSQL came out, uh, they announced that you, you know, they announced they were using skip lists, and everyone was asking them, how, how do you do reverse scans? And at the time when they first came out, they said, well, we can't do that. You actually have to have two indexes, right? And they got a lot of flack for that. And so this reverse iteration approach that they're proposing here is a way to get around that problem. Um, skip lists were actually also first explored in, by the Microsoft guys when they were figuring out what Hecatem was. 
right? In the early days, when they knew what they wanted to do MVCC, and they were trying to figure out what data structure they used, they were exploring index or so they were exploring skip lists. And they would give these internal talks at Microsoft, you know, talking about the advantages of using skip lists over a B plus tree. And so what happened was the MemSQL founder was at Microsoft at the time, and he saw them giving these talks about skip lists. So that's how he got the idea to use that in, in MemSQL. Now, the paper you're going to read next week is about the BW tree, where they basically said at Microsoft, skip lists are a bad idea, or they're not as good as we thought they were. And they went ahead and still went with a B plus tree variant, whereas the MemSQL guys are still using uh, skip lists. I think roughly they're about the same. I, maybe on next, next Wednesday, I'll show you some benchmark numbers. They're, they're roughly equivalent uh, for most workloads. I, I don't think there's anything, um, you know, we want, one is not significantly better than another. Um, but this is an interesting data structure that's only been around since the 1990s, I and mean, only now is it actually getting picked up and used in some systems. So MemSQL uses this, WireTiger uses this, and it might be a couple others use it as well. Yes? So one of the problems you mentioned that came on the previous slide was uh, there's not very good cache locality. Yes. So are you saying that does not have a very large performance impact? If you're doing point queries, no. Okay. Who cares, right? You just jump to the thing you want, you're done. Um, if you have to scan the entire thing, then yes. But if you have to scan the entire table, you might just be better off like jumping to some location uh, in, in the table if it's clustered, and then be able to just scan the blocks at, from, the, from the tuples directly. I actually don't know whether MemSQL uses cluster indexes or not. Um, if you had cluster indexes, then, then this cache locality problem wouldn't be, wouldn't be that significant. Um, but they're using MVCC. I don't know whether they're using in-place updates or not. So does everyone know what a clustered index is? No, okay, so a clustered index is where you have the sort order of the, of the rows in the table heap match the sort order in the index. So if I have, if I have uh, key, two, key one, two, three, four, and five, and six, in my table heap, they'll be ordered one, two, three, four, five, six. So if you have a clustered index, if I want to do a scan from two to five, I could just follow this index to get to, to tuple two, and then scan in that order in, in the table heap until I hit tuple five, and I know I've gotten everything that I wanted. So MySQL sorts, has clustered indexes on, on their primary keys. A bunch of different database systems do this as well. OK. So now let's talk about doing concurrency control inside of an index. So the key thing to remember is that the database system is going to have to treat indexes differently than the regular tuples in the table heap. And the reason is because in the, with tuples, we only really care about whether the logical contents have changed from one transaction to another. In the index, we actually now need to care about whether the physical structure changes as well, because we don't want to be traversing an index and all of a sudden someone moves a pointer out from us and we jump to a memory location that's invalid. So we need to be careful about how not only the logical contents of what the values are or the keys in the, in, in the index, but also what the data structure looks like. And so that's essentially what locking and latching does. So let's look at two different problem scenarios. So let's say that transaction one wants to do a check to see whether key 25 exists. So it'll start at the root node, take a share lock on the, the node, take a share lock on this guy here, and now we're doing latch crabbing, or it's called coupling in the paper. So once we get the share lock on C, we know we can release the share lock on A because we, you know, we've, we've, we've already been able to get down to the point we want to be in the tree. Then we get down here, share lock on F, then voila, we see our slot for 25 is empty, so we'll, we, we, we'll be able to insert something in there. But now we release our shared lock, and 25 comes along. It crabs all the way down, taking exclusive locks, because it wants to insert 25, puts it in there. Then we come back, and now we try to insert 25 for ourselves. We can take exclusive locks, and now we're going to see that our, the, the, the value that we thought wasn't there, the key that we thought wasn't there, is now there. So this is latch crabbing doesn't help us here. We've got to do something else. Another scenario is that we want to do a range scan. Maybe this transaction wants to do a range scan from 12 to 23, share locks all the way down, and for simplicity, we'll just say it acquires the share lock on its neighbor. Uh, in practice, you just can't take share locks going across horizontally because someone else might be coming in, in the other direction and you would have a deadlock condition, but for simplicity, let's assume you can do that. So we do our scan. Now another transaction comes along and inserts 21. And now when we come back and scan again, we're going to get a phantom because we'll, take, we'll, do our, we'll do a scan on this node here, and we'll see that there's now a value 21, which didn't exist before. So this is why we need to be able to, to handle, the, handle uh, 
locking and latching inside the index and not just in the table space as well. So the key difference to understand between locks and latches are locks are the things that are protect the logical contents of the database. So tuples, tuples values, uh, phantom tuples, you know, ranges and things like that. And these, these need to be held for the duration of a transaction. And we also need to be able to roll back changes in case the transaction fails. Right? So we have to maintain an undo log so that if a transaction aborts, we can reverse our changes. Latches are what typically are, we refer to in a database system as sort of the micro locks, the low level locks in, for the internals of the database system. Now the problem is in sort of other areas of computer science like operating systems, they use the word lock where in databases we, re we really mean latch. Like a latch is like a mutex, a low level thing that we're going to protect a critical section of the internal data structures. And so for a latch, the transaction is going to only hold it for the duration that it needs to do that operation. So remember, we, so the, if you think back to like the Hackathon paper, they were taking write locks on the timestamps inside the tuple, and they had to hold those lo write locks until the transaction finished. But when it did other modifications, like installing updates, it would take latches on the, on the tuple itself, and it would do whatever operation it needs to do, and then release that latch. So this, this is the same thing. And so in the case of a latch, the transaction never needs to be able to roll back its changes because we're doing things at a physical level. Right? So we, we, we acquire the latch, make our change, and then it gets applied. And then once that, we're done. We don't need to maintain any undue information and roll that back. So there's this great table in the survey paper you guys read that gives, lays out the, how locks and latches are uh, distinguished from each other. And I like it because it, sort of lays, it talks about every possible aspect of how you're going to use these two different constructs. So in the case of locks, we're going to use them to separate user and transactions from each other. We're going to be modifying the database contents, and we're going to hold them for the entire transaction. And then we have a bunch of different modes we can handle. And then we're going to be able to use deadlock detection and resolution to deal with deadlock scenarios. So the locks, transactions will be able to acquire the locks as they need them, but then there'll be something else, like a lock manager, something else in the background that's going to be, make sure that we don't have any deadlocks, we don't have any problems, and can abort things and free things up as needed. In the case of a latch, we want to protect threads from each other because they're both accessing the same data structures. Um, and we pretty much are only going to have simple read and write locks. In general, sometimes you only have a simple, you know, simple global lock for the, for the data structure, for the element you're trying to modify. And the key thing is that we're not going to have a background thread to protect us to make sure we don't do something stupid and have deadlocks. It's only through careful coding uh, and discipline of the actual software engineer that's building the database system and building these indexes and using these latches are we going to be able to have you know, concurrent operations that don't deadlock from each other? Right? So that's sort of the key, that's the main thing you have to recognize. And when you do this for project number two, sometimes you have to take locks and sometimes you're going to have to take latches. And it's up to you to make sure that you don't, you don't end up with deadlocks for, for, for these. So the index, index locks are essentially managed with a lock table. So you can think of this sort of, sort of as a hash table that has some logical naming scheme for locks. And then for each lock, there will be a queue of transactions that are waiting to acquire the lock or, or hold the lock. So typically what happens is that whatever the first lock, first transaction in the queue, it's the one that holds that lock. It doesn't necessarily have to be one transaction. So in this case here, we have three transactions that all want a shared lock on, uh, on a single logical lock. So therefore they can all acquire that because shared locks can be shared with each other. Right? So the, where latches fit into this is that any time we need to update this queue, we need to take a latch on it because that's a data structure that is protect. It's a data structure we need to protect and, av and avoid you know, dangling pointers and things like that, right? So we would take latches in order to acquire a lock. Is one way to think about it. So now another thing, key thing they talked about in the paper is that there are some people out there that that talk about how they have lock-free indexes or lock-free data structures. And it's not really quite clear what that means in the context of database systems. So the two possibilities are a lock-free index could be something that has no logical locks. So that means the transaction does not need to acquire any lock at, at, for an element any time it needs to modify anything. And we saw this in the OCC case because you did all your changes in your private workspace, and any time you modified a tuple that was in your private workspace, you didn't have to lock it from, from anybody else, right? But now the key is that you still have to use latches at the end in order to install those updates. So it's, so it's not lock-free as if this magical data structure that doesn't use any construct f for critical regions, critical sections. It's just it's not using logical locks, but you still need physical latches. 
Another data structure could be have no latches at all. Uh, and essentially to do this, you're, you have to do multi-versioning inside of the index itself. So you can use sort of like shadow paging or other techniques like that to make that work. And you can use it, the compare and swap operations to apply your pointer updates automatically. But, and this is essentially what we could do in our OCC case, uh, sorry, in the MVCC case, but we still have to acquire locks at the end in order to validate the transactions. So it's, again, there's no magic data structure that's going to be entirely lock-free and latch-free, uh, and transactional memory doesn't help you, right? It sort of obfuscates the problem in some ways. There's always going to be some way to coordinate and synchronize across threads, and whether you're doing this with physical latches or logical locks, you know, depends on what index you're using. So that's something to just be mindful when you, when you read literature and people talk about their lock-free data structure. It probably still means that they're using latches. Okay, so now I want to go through the the locking schemes that are we talked about in, in the survey paper. Now you may be kind of confused of why, like I had you read papers on multi-version concurrency control and OCC. There were all these optimistic schemes that weren't doing locking, and then I throw back how to do two-phase locking inside of a of an index. And the reason why is because on on Wednesday, you'll read papers about doing uh, optimistic, uh, optimistic operations inside of an index that are sort of like MVC and OCC uh, without having to use locks, but you still have to use latches. So I want to see, first understand what high-level locking does, why it's not, it sucks, and why it's hard, and then that'll motivate why this, the indexes we'll talk about next time uh, aren't able to get better performance over these other approaches. So the very first locking scheme that was proposed actually came out of the System R project from IBM in the 1970s. Um, the System R project, I think, was fascinating, right? They basically had like eight people with PhDs, some in computer science, some in mathematics, right? Because back then, you know, you didn't get a PhD in databases because they didn't really exist. Uh, they basically took eight really smart people and they put them in a room and said, build a database system. And then every person went off, you know, every person in that eight, group of eight went off and did, you know, designed and built this one piece of the system. So one person worked on uh, you know, cost-based cost query optimization. Somebody else worked on you know, storage models, storage management. Uh, other people worked on developing the SQL language. And one of the things that Jim Gray worked on, who won the Tourney Award when he was at System R, he worked on this idea of transactions and consistency models. And so they had this paper in the 1970s that described a way to check to see whether transactions conflict using high-level logical predicate locks. So the basic idea of a predicate lock is that you're going to take the where clause of a select statement and map that to the key space of the table, and you'll apply, you know, that'll be the, the, the granularity that you apply the lock. So if you have a select query, it's just the where clause. If you have an insert, update, or delete, you're, you acquire an exclusive lock on the where clause. I mean, the, the insert doesn't have a, a where clause, so it's just the, you know, quality predicate based on the values you're trying to insert, right? This sounds awesome. This sounds like this would be the, the exactly what we want, but it's actually really hard to impl implement in practice. So no system actually ever implemented this. They never did it in System R, and no one's even come close to something like this in, in a real database system. And we'll see why in a second. Um, it provides, I think, the best granularity for locking that you can have. Uh, it's just the overhead of figuring out whether one predicate range is intersects with another predicate is really difficult to do. It's not an MPP, MP complete problem, but it is uh, very inefficient to actually implement in practice. So let's see what it looks like here. So say we have two queries. The first one is to do a sum balance on the account table where uh, the, the, the account name is Tupac. And then we'll do another insert into the account table where uh, for Tupac with a balance of 100. So in the first, first case here, our predicate lock is going to be based on where name equals Tupac. And so you can think of this as, the, again, the entire key space of, the, of this table, and therefore the predicate name equals Tupac covers these, this range here. And then for this guy here, because it's an insert query, we just convert it to a conjunction predicate with equalities, and we see that name equals Tupac and balance equals 100 uh, overlaps with our, our, our region over here, and therefore these two conflicts intersect, these two predicates intersect, and therefore they would have to have a conflict, right? So this seems like a simple example in a 2D projection, right? But now as you can imagine, if you have more complicated queries and more complicated predicates, this gets really hard to actually implement. Right? You can sort of think of it as like a multidimensional space of all possible predicates and all possible values you could have for your attributes in, in, your, in your table. And then now you're trying to decide whether the space that is encapsulated by this predicate has an intersection with the predicate from the other query. 
and you need to do this for hundreds of queries running at the same time. Right? So it's really hard to, be, to, to do this. Um, in practice, one way to think about what they're doing versus what we'll talk about in a second, they're trying to figure out what locks to take on, on a, for a transaction or a query before you actually run the query. What I mean by that is like we can look at the predicate and, and decide logically whether two predicates overlap versus the physical locking that's done in, in the other types of index locks are only applying the locks when you actually try to go access the data. So to do predicate locks, you actually don't even need to execute the query. You just need to analyze the predicate. But all the other locks we'll talk about, you actually have to, as you're running the query, you, you acquire the locks before you actually access the object you want. So this is what essentially what key value locks are going to do. So we're now we're going to build up to get to the hierarchical locking, which, which most, most database systems implement. But we're going to have the little building blocks to get us there. So in key value locking, it's pretty straightforward. Basically, we want to get a single key for a single a single lock for a single key that's in our index. This is to be done in, in the leaf nodes because we, we said that we only need to worry about locking the leaf nodes. We don't care about the upper level stuff. We apply, acquire latches for them in order to rebalance them, but the logical locking only needs to be done in, in, the, in the leaves. So in this case here, if we want to check to see if 14 exists, uh, we would acquire the lock for it, and then nobody else could modify this as, as, as we go. The next thing we need to handle are the gaps. So let's say I want to check to see whether 15 exists, uh, but in this case here, I have increments of two, so there's no element 15 in my key. This is another example, why, or another reason why you can't have the locks be embedded directly in the index. You have to use an external lock table because there is no key 15, so there's no way for me to set a lock on something that's not there. Uh, so instead, we'll have what we call gap locks, where basically we say between these two key elements, there's a gap, and I inquire a lock on that gap. So to inquire a lock on the item 15 that doesn't exist, I would acquire the gap lock on from 14 to 16 exclusively. So now we can, we can combine the key value locks and the gap locks to give us key range locks. And the idea of a key range lock is that we're going to take uh, chunks of ranges in our key space and apply the same locking mechanism that we have for gap locks and key value locks. Um, and it's going to allow us to cover a larger space of the key space, a lar larger range of the key space. You know, with fewer number of locks. So instead of having to acquire a key value lock and a gap lock separately, I can get a key range lock and get both of them with one invocation to the, to the lock manager. And then I'm going to be able to define different modes for how I acquire these locks in my lock manager to make it easy for me to decide whether two key ranges overlap and therefore I can, and their operations are commutative. So for example, if I have a key range lock from 14 to 15 and you have from 16 to, to, to 14, if we both have a shared lock for the part of our ranges that overlap, it's safe for us to go and access the same data with each other. So this is what key range locks are going to allow us to do very efficiently. So essentially it looks like this. We still have our gaps. Uh, and so we can have a next key lock would be 14 plus the gap. Or a prior key lock would be 14 and below the gap to 12. And again, we can acquire these in one invocation to the lock manager to get to cover this range. This also handles the virtual keys. Uh, so let's say that we want to care about things from 16 to infinity. We can, again, we hire a key range lock, lock for that, and the same way for, for the other direction as well. In practice, most database systems actually implement the next key. Uh, it doesn't matter which one you actually do, as long as you're consistent. So you can't mix the next key locks and the prior key locks. You, only, you can only have you know, one type. And there's no one, you know, no one way is better than another. In practice, like InnoDB and, and, and other things, they all use next key locking. So now we have this sort of same problem we had you know, motivating why we need the key range locks is that if we need to acquire locks for a large range of keys, we have to go acquire individual key, key, uh, next key locks for every single one of them. So this is where hierarchical locking comes in. So it's going to allow us to, to acquire a lock for a larger key space um, using different modes to provide hints to other transactions that are running at the same time about what we intend to do with the elements that we have locked. And this is going to allow us to reduce the number of trips we have to make into, into the lock manager uh, to cover a, lo a lot of different, a, a wide range of, of keys. So for example, let's say I acquired an intention exclusive lock from, from range 10 to 16 uh, exclusive or inclusive. Uh, and what this is basically saying is the transaction that acquired the intention lock is telling other transactions that I intend to modify something 
within this range. I don't know what it's going to be yet, but I, I plan to take an exclusive lock inside of this. So nobody can come along and try to take a share lock at the same time. So then now within my range, I can acquire the exclusive lock on exactly the, the data that I, that I want to lock and modify. And somebody else could acquire an exclusive, uh, intention exclusive lock on the same range and acquire an exclusive, exclusive lock on another part of the, the, the key space here and can modify it without, at the same time without us having a conflict. So it's a way to provide additional concurrency in the system um, with reducing the number of trips to, to the lock manager. And then you have the same, follow the same sort of strict two-phase locking and regular two-phase locking protocol where you have to hold on locks until to the shrinking phase and then you, you can release all of them. So not only are we locking the tuples in our regular table heap, we're also locking these key ranges in our, in our index space as well. So that's sort of clear. So it's different than the hierarchical locking you may, you may learn in like uh, an intro class where you can lock a tuple, you can lock the page the tuple's in, the table of the database. We're doing hierarchical locking within the range along the leaf nodes and not in the upper levels of the tree because we don't care about the upper levels of the tree in terms of the logical contents. We only care about their physical, uh, physical layout. And for that, we protect the latches. Okay? So, uh, again, essentially everything I just said, hierarchical locking is allow us to do, we, we essentially can get predicate locks without the expensive and uh, difficult implementation of having to evaluate whether, whether two predicates are, are overlapping. And we're only going to do index locking within the leaf nodes, but then we'll use latching to preserve the consistent data structure uh, for the, the entire tree. Um, so in the same way that we've been reading about in-memory uh, concurrent schemes that are sort of more recent implementations of them that are really fast, indexing is now the, a hot area as well. So there's a, you'll read this on Wednesday, but the papers that have been come out in the last five years are all about how to do fast indexing for in-memory databases by using other techniques than locking that we're talking about here uh, to get better concurrency and better parallelism. So any questions about indexing and, 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 and all of this? Okay, so now I want to spend some time a little bit talking about prison tattoos. So again, as I said, uh, if you're going to be involved in databases, chances are you may end up in prison. It happens to a lot of us, uh, not me in particular, but there's, uh, there's other famous database people who have spent time in prison. So part of what I want you to get out of this course and this lecture here is to understand how to be able to deal with these various factions of gang members you may en encounter while in prison or in the streets and be able to assess the situation and understand what is this person's motivation and where are they coming from. And you can do this by, by identifying key aspects of their tattoos. So I want to go through sort of the five most popular tattoos and then you can, you know, you can find more information online and learn about, more about these, uh, these, these gangs and other things. So the most popular tattoo uh, that you've probably seen for is the teardrop. And this is typically done along the eye. It doesn't matter what it's, whether it's left eye or right eye. Um, and this, used, this is used to signal, signal that the person has been involved in a murder. Um, and if the, if the teardrop is filled in, it means it they were successful, they actually killed the other person. If it's not filled in, it's just an outline of the teardrop, then it usually means that it was an attempted murder and they didn't succeed, uh, but they might try it again. Right? And the number of teardrops corresponds to the number of murders that, that they've been involved in. So you, a lot of times you see this in a lot of celebrities today, a lot of musicians. This is sort of one popular thing that uh, is, may not necessarily mean that they were in a gang, but in practice, if you're in prison, if someone has this, they probably were, they probably were involved in a murder. Another famous tattoo, or a very common tattoo, is the three dots. And so in the case of, unlike the teardrop, the three dots doesn't necessarily always have to be next to the eye. Right? You can have it on the wrist, you can have it on other body parts. Um, the three dots are meant to represent uh, la vida loca, basically my crazy life. And it's just to, meant, just to mean to, to signal to other people that the person with this tattoo is involved in, you know, in a wild lifestyle, thuggery, and other things like that, right? A lot of celebrities have this. Ice Cube has this, although he was a founding member in, in NWA. Um, and the reason why they usually do dots is because when you're in prison, you don't obviously have a tattoo parlor. So you can do these tattoos by taking uh, you know, uh, a lighter to a Bic pen and, like, with a sewing needle and you sort of jab it into the skin, and that, that'll produce the same effect. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean they don't have to line up, they don't have to be in a triangle. As I've shown an example here, they sort of have three dots that are just you know, in a straight line. Right? It's essentially, as long as there's three dots, that means, means my crazy life. It's very important, though, for you to, maybe to 
not confuse three dots with five dots. So the five dots are always going to be on the hand. Right? You'll never see them on the eye. You'll never really see them on any other body part. And this will mean that this person has been in prison. So if you see them on the outside of prison and they have five dots, it means that they were incarcerated in the past. And the five dots are in, in, in the shape of a quinox, and essentially means that uh, it's supposed to represent their time in prison. So the four dots on the outside are the prison walls, and then the one dot in the middle represents the, the person that's been incarcerated in prison. Right? And again, I, would, I, I don't want to judge, but usually these are, you know, these are the people that are more hardened than the, the three dots thing. Right? The three dots mean, could just mean you like the party. Five dots means you, best, you definitely were in the pokey. You definitely spent time. So these are sort of the three standard tattoos you can have that sort of have follow the same formula or the same iconography. I now want to discuss two different gang tattoos. They don't follow the same formula, but I want to show you how you can identify what gang they're in based on what symbols that they use. So the first gang is the Maria Salv Salvatrucha gang, uh, and this is a prison gang that started in Los Angeles. Um, this, and they're, they're basically a bunch of sound, uh, El Salvadorians, um, although they have ties with the Mexican cartel. And typically what you see for these tattoos, you'll see the letters MS followed by the number 13. And so again, it doesn't, they're not going to be in a specific pattern. They're not going to be arranged in an exact way. The, usually the letters and the numbers are arranged as, as part of other artwork that's on the body. So the MS obviously just means Maria Salvatrucha. The 13 isn't, doesn't correspond with a date or anything special. It just means that M is the 13th letter uh, in the alphabet, right? And you see in this case here, they have MS on the back. It doesn't have to be in the back. A lot of times you see it on the chest or, or along the neck here. Uh, and these are a pretty ruthless gang. I, I, I think the number is like maybe 50,000 members across prisons in the US. Um, and so they're, they're a pretty, pretty tough group. And then the last one I'll talk about is the Aryan Brotherhood. So these are usually like skinheads or like neo-Nazis. And so you'll see the same thing. You'll see like the, the initials AB to, as abbreviation for, for, for Aryan Brotherhood. But then you're also going to see often the numbers 14 and, the 80, and number 88. So 14 uh, corresponds to some stupid slogan from Hitler that has 14 words in it. Right? I don't remember what it is, but that's, that's what it means. 88 is actually not the number 88, but actually two eights together. And this corresponds to the, the slogan Heil Hitler, where that's, that both of those words start with H, and H is the eighth letter of the alphabet. So you see 14 and 88, and that's what it usually means there. Um, a lot of times, the Maria Salvatrucha gangs, they'll be very colorful and a lot of different artwork, whereas in the Ar Aryan Brotherhood gangs, they're usually black and uh, monochrome. OK, so uh, like I said, the, knowing these tattoos are important going forward when you, when you get involved in databases. Uh, for next class, we're going to talk about the BW tree mostly, but also talk about how to do concurrent skip lists and the art index, which is from the hyper guys, which is a uh, radix tree. It's very important for you to understand what we're going to talk about next class, because that's essentially what project two is going to be about. You're going to have to build a concurrent index, and you'll have to follow the, one of the techniques that we're going to talk about here. Okay? Any questions? All right, we're done. See you guys. See, see you on Wednesday.